You are listening to No, You're Crazy. My name is Susan Denae. We all have crazy. What separates us is how we choose to deal with it. I'm going to be delivering engaging and actionable tools to own your crazy, treat your crazy, and turn it into your own superpower. I hope that you walk away from this show feeling the power and strength within you. And never forget to enjoy your journey because you are worth it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Know Your Crazy Talk Show. My name is Susan Denae, and you are listening to Emotional Recovery in the Raw. Specifically today, I'm going to be talking about top practices that I have implemented for my sobriety over the last 22 years. You know, hopefully if you're someone in sobriety who's been doing this sober thing for a while, you also you understand that there are things that we practice continuously and consistently that helps us stay clean and sober. And there's never even a question of wanting to drink or use again. It just becomes our lifestyle, but it's work. It is emotional and mental and spiritual work, spiritual. If you choose to some folks stay clean without that aspect. And I will cover some of that in today's show. So as time proceeds forward, the quality of life for a recovered alcoholic or addict is dependent on their continuous ability to self-check and self-regulate. After years of leaning on drugs and alcohol to balance emotionally, mentally, and physically, someone in recovery must dedicate endless days to putting their best foot forward. This can get tiring after a while. It can feel relentless. So how do we do that? What principles are important to keep at the forefront of our thinking? What actions are necessary to maintain healthy relationships regardless of our temper tantrums or even at our seemingly ease at which we can fall into emotional manipulation within our relationships with others? As we learn to recognize our weaknesses, we must also find the strength to stay confident in who we are becoming because the new person will feel odd, almost foreign. In today's show, I am sharing my top practices that have carried me through those 22 years of recovery. Uh, hoping that, you know, if there's someone out there listening to the show today who could really use some inspiration or reminders of why they do this, or someone in early recovery who is suffering realizing that once that drink or the drug's been taken away, it's challenging to live life on life's terms. Maybe today's show will be of service to you. So that is my hope. My inspiration for the for the show today, some of this inspiration comes at the last minute. This was one of those. Uh, that I was reached out to by email, someone wanting me to speak for a sobriety summit in the near future. I had never met this individual before. She found me through social media. We got online today and we began to connect. And the ease at which we bonded because of being two sober women in recovery, a 15 minute call, I think turned into like a 45 minute call. Because those of us in sobriety who have been to hell and back, there's a bond that only we speak. There's a relationship that we have that is unique unto us because we understand the struggle that is behind recovering from not only the physical addiction to things, but the mental obsession that can accompany uh, with addiction and alcoholism. And, you know, before you know it, 45 minutes flies by, and I almost did the show on just relationships and sobriety and with sober individuals and how that bond is so real. You know, I listened to a lot of influencers over the years, especially over the last five years when I decided to change up my professional world. And I began listening to a lot of motivational speakers and top, you know, top speakers in their industry, top life coaches. And every time I would hear one of them talk, I would just kind of chuckle because in the rooms of recovery, we've been telling that story for a long time. We've been inspiring one another for a long time. And it always, I always find it interesting how a lot of the tactics that we apply to stay clean and sober are the same ones that high flute and coaches are touting today. Uh, and, and so I'm going to go through some of those things. So some of these things might sound familiar to you if you're sober. Um, but I think some of these things are just a nice reminder of what we need to keep at the top of our priority of our principles so that we have 
a fun life, a joyous life, and a life of fulfillment while we are clean and sober. Because I don't know about you folks, but I didn't get sober to be miserable. I did not get sober to stay stuck in self-pity. I did not get sober to stay overwhelmed every single day. I did not get sober so that I could cheat and lie within my relationships. I got sober for a chance at life that I had never experienced before. And it was one of the hardest things I ever did. And yet it has also been the most rewarding. You know, we go through hard times in our life and we have to ask ourselves, who would I be if that didn't happen? Sobriety for me is that it is a way of life. It is something that I live every single day. So to do that successfully and to still walk away at the end of the day and feel gratitude and appreciation for my life. How did I do that over 22 years? Well, I'm going to share some of those top ones. Uh, first off, when I started thinking about, there's so many things I could, I could say I practice. So many things in sobriety that I believe a lot of us practice, but what are, what are kind of like the in-depth principles? And I'm going to even say the framework that, that kind of cushions the whole picture of sobriety. Okay, number one, I wanted to talk about rediscovering integrity with ourselves. Many of us, when we are in our cups or we are drinking or we are drugging and we are so far down in the disease of addiction and alcoholism, we forgot what it meant to be a person of our word. We manipulated and negotiated so much so that we could just stay tolerant of our own behavior in our addiction that we, we didn't even know what meaning your word and keeping your word meant. We may have told ourselves that, but every day, and, and this really relates to somebody who, if you're sober, if you're still in your cups using and drinking and you're listening to this show and you're like, oh, this doesn't relate, this show ain't for you. This is for the individuals who understood that they could not live a life if they continued to get high, drink alcohol, snort stuff up their nose, put stuff in their veins, like they could not do it in order to keep living. They understood and I understood that I had to be the biggest piece that I had to let go to get into integrity with myself was to get sober. So we start to rediscover integrity and in sobriety. Where am I doing what I say I'm going to do and where am I not doing what I say I'm going to do? Because for those of us in recovery, we understand that that is one of the most important things to do. If you want self-esteem, do esteemable things. Number two, I'm not going to say number two because this is the framework. So another piece of that framework that is huge in recovery that has to be practiced consistently, no matter how much time of years and clean time you got, is accountability. How often when we are in the disease of alcoholism and addiction that we avoid accountability. We are either blaming other people for our problems to a fault, or we are blaming ourselves so much inwardly that we can't see past our own misery and our own self-centered pity that we are not accountable to the uh, behaviors that we are carrying in our life and in the relationships with others. So accountability. One, we got to get into integrity. But number two, we are in a consistent state of accountability. We do not escape denial too much in sobriety. Action, not thinking. This is a big one for those of us in sobriety. So this is something that's going to consistently be practiced when we understand that overanalyzing what we think we know to the point of no action is exactly something that can make us procrastinate and not get into solution. For someone to get sober, we have to take an action, put the drink down, put the drug down, and then we begin taking actionable steps and habit changes are necessary to keep that going. And the only way that we can do that is if we stay into action and don't begin to try to figure it out, think our way. One of the things that I have noticed over the years in working with others that when somebody decides to change it up and they've got years of recovery under their belt, but they haven't really been routinely staying into integrity and they haven't checked in, they, they've been out of accountability, this action versus thinking thing is a big deal because they've been trying to think their way out of stuff for so long 
that now they can't, they don't even know where the accountability would be at because, you know, we can't use the same head to solve the same problem. The last of, of the framework is really having an idea and a, and a uh, consideration of the emotional awareness. I mean, this show in and of itself, when I say emotional recovery in the raw, you will be listening to emotional recovery in the raw because the emotional recovery is the guiding post. It, it is the, that's it. We have to understand how our emotions lead us how they guide us, how they take us uh, hostage at times. Because if we don't understand that crazy about ourselves, if we don't understand, and when I'm talking about emotional awareness, I'm talking about the negative emotional awareness. Yes, it's good to have emotional awareness of the good stuff. That's usually the easy one that we easily accept into our life. It's the negative emotional aware. It's the negative emotions that we will try to justify. We will try to get out of. We will try to pretend as if it's not there. That is the emotional awareness that I am talking about. And so overall, as we stay sober over a period of time, these things, these, this framework, once again, rediscovering integrity you know, in a consistent way. Am I in integrity within what I'm saying and what I'm doing? Holding ourselves accountable, being accountable to our behaviors when they negatively affect somebody else. Okay. The next one, having tangible actions that we are taking in our life, not just trying to think our way out of it. I have, I've personally been through this. I have coached and mentored women and men and couples who have been through this, where we think we know so much and yet we stay emotionally sick because we're not taking tangible actions to change it up. And that's not always an easy thing. Trust me, it's not. And then the last one is Staying consistently aware of our emotional natures when it is a negative emotional nature. Staying consistently aware of our negative emotional nature and how it crops up. It is the title of the show. It's about understanding how our crazy operates for us because unless we have learned to identify, become familiar with that crazy we may be out there hurting others, most importantly, hurting ourselves and not even know it. So understanding that emotional trigger that we can go through. So that I would say encompasses like the top practices that I'm going to go over with you. Uh, that encompasses like underneath, it's like the foundation. So I can give you all these sober practices that I'm going to share with you, which some may argue my life practices, but these are sober practices. I specifically thought of this and, and really reflected back and the, the people that I've worked with or even my own work and really thought to myself, what are practices that a sober person would relate to and understand for their sobriety? So I could give you those all day long, but if you are not somebody who wants to practice integrity, or if you are not somebody who wants to practice accountability, if you are not someone who wants to take some tangible action when you've done thought yourself into some crazy and you are not somebody who's willing to look at that emotional turmoil that you can put yourself in, none of these practices are going to work. They're just not going to work because there's a foundation that is missing with the practices. You know, I, I can I can practice not being a bank robber all day. Right. But if I if I you know, if I'm not in integrity, it's not going to matter. Hopefully that made sense. I don't really know if that made sense. So when we come back, when I come back, I'm going to go over with you the top practices to help in sobriety so that you have a rewarding life when I come back. Be back shortly. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Know You're Crazy show. You are listening to Emotional Recovery in the Raw. Today's show are the top practices in sobriety. What are the top sobriety practices? In the first part of the first few minutes of the show, I'm just talking about kind of like a foundation in sobriety, being willing to stay within integrity, being willing to take accountability, being willing to spot when you need action versus thinking. And last was being willing to have emotional awareness of when you're off, when that negative emotional awareness, being aware of when that is happening so that it doesn't hijack you, your mood, and your relationships. That's what I covered on the first part of the show. So the rest of the show, I'm going to be spent, I'm going to be spending time just talking to you about what are top practices in sobriety. 
you know, as I reflected today, honestly, it didn't take me long to do this outline. And I'm sure there's plenty more practices in addition to this. Uh, because I come from the rooms of recovery, that is my foundation. That's what my whole life had been built around. And I still return to those rooms of recovery. Uh, some of this may seem a little bit uh, repetitive, but I really tried to make it unique for anybody who's sober, even folks who don't do the meeting route and maybe folks who have like a, a narcotic sobriety date or an addict sobriety date, but they still occasionally drink, but they still in some respects will appreciate and understand having to give up something really difficult for them uh, because it would have taken them, right? And so I tried to, when I thought about this, I I really just tried to focus, it might not be in my definition of sobriety for people. Uh, you know, for me, when I say really sober, I mean really sober. But for me, really sober is no mind altering substance. I'm not going to smoke weed. I'm not going to drink alcohol. I'm not going to do drug like hardcore drugs. I'm not going to do narcotics. Uh, but I am going to drink caffeine. Okay. So some people might be, well, then that's not sober. That's okay. If somebody smokes cigarettes, I would still think you're sober. Like but some people might argue, well, that's nicotine. So that's my definition and each of us get to define what it means for us personally, because I can't define it for you. You have to define it for you for what works with you. And why is that? Because you have to be accountable to that and you have to have your own integrity around your drug use, your alcohol use or whatever it is for you. So as I go through these, hopefully uh, these practices will relate to anybody who is, is claiming a date of sobriety in any form, uh, maybe something they can relate to. All right, so, and I did, I just put these in kind of random order. The most important ones I left for the bottom, but how I numbered them was like number one. So quite frankly, number 10 is gonna be like the best one, right? But starting out, uh, number one, what is a practice that I have done over the years that has helped me stay clean? I've had to admit when something isn't working. We have to be admit when something isn't working. And the best way to do that is to really take a look every now and then, take a look at your mood. Have I been feeling depressed? Am I feeling sad? Am I constantly in this state of uh, turmoil? Some type of emotional turmoil. It might be related to a relationship. It might be related to a job. But what is the length of time that that has been going on? What is the length of time that has been going on? What I have found in myself and working with other recovered addicts and alcoholics is we are highly tolerant of messed up behavior within ourselves and with others. We, we over tolerate to an extreme because we have this tendency to really carry a lot of BS, quite honestly. So having the ability to admit this ain't working no more, this ain't working no more. So what are a couple of things besides just recognizing the, remember the, the foundation, the emotional uncomfortableness, the emotional awareness, okay? See, I'm already talking about that, aren't I? You're realizing you've been in a state of emotional turmoil for a while and then admitting to yourself, I'm tired. This ain't working no more. There's no right or wrong time for that awareness of when you're ready to shift it up, but the just admitting it can be something. Um, I've had to do this in, you know, uh, first marriage. I had to do it with a career of 20 years. Uh, usually what's going to happen is I always like to say, what is the feedback I'm getting to show me that this isn't working no more? If it's a professional that's not working, maybe a job's not working anymore. You know, there's a lot of negative feedback at work. There's a lot of tension. You're resistant every day. Uh, you know, the universe has given you messages like this is not the work for you anymore. There's a constant drag. You're in regretful mode of it. Uh, relationships, you know, what would be feedback that the universe is giving you in a relationship? Turmoil. I had a mentor tell me one time when I was working on a relationship, she looked at me and she's like, Susan, relationship shouldn't be this hard. Relationship shouldn't be this hard. And even as I say that right now, part of me wants to argue it and be like, well, sometimes you got to work at it, but only you can determine, is this work obnoxious at this point? And am I, why am I hanging on to something that I shouldn't be hanging on to? I think one of the, uh, one of the few times I got a lot of feedback was on a, on one of my shows I did on this topic about learning to let go. And some, I think it was a guy was really upset with me saying that it's okay to walk away. You know, and how many people walk away soon they don't stay and fight. But 
you know, fight for it. But if it's taken your peace and you're consistently, especially if there's abuse in the situation, just saying, number one, in sobriety, admitting when something's not working. Number two, practice, completely surrendering. Surrendering to the idea that you don't know what to do. Surrendering to the idea that there must be a different way of doing this and accepting the fact that a new perception might be a solution to the problem. You know, the game in sobriety for many of us is coming into a, an understanding that my way isn't working no more. My way just isn't working no more. You know, what? and in the beginning, the reason we relate so much on rock bottom is because that is the telltale. That is the ultimate feedback that we are just, and some of us die, right? I mean, that's how bad it gets. But have we gotten to the point where we are 100% willing to surrender our perception and be willing to take on a new one? Are we willing to surrender our perception and be willing to take on a new one? Sometimes uh, in that first one that I listed off, so the first one, the admitting something isn't working, sometimes when we surrender and we open ourselves up to a new perception, it starts to work. It starts to work. So that thing that we admitted wasn't working, suddenly we've surrendered our will and our way of looking at something and things start to turn around and it kind of surprises us. But one of the practices that if we, if we do it in sobriety over and over and over and we become comfortable with surrendering and just letting go, you know, it's when we dig our heels in and we believe that our way is the only way or we feel justified in our rights. Uh, some feedback or some behaviors that may be true for you, if this is you, uh, hanging on too tight. That's just a visual. I have a couple people I work with that's like, oh my God, they're just hanging on to their way. They just won't let go. And you know it because there's complaints of misery. There's complaints of uncomfortableness. And yet there's, there's no, remember that other thing I said, action versus thinking? There's not a lot of action to change their way. So there's no surrendering to the idea that my perception isn't working. So they stay in a struggle status for a very long time. So second practice in sobriety, learning to surrender and be willing to download a new perception. Okay, what's next? Number three, asking for feedback from someone not personally attached. Are you the only decision maker in your life about your life? Just wondering. And if you are, it might be working for you. It might be successful. You might be doing well with that. Um, if you're somebody who is a sober individual and you are recovering from some sort of addiction, um, I would say be careful because how our little inner addict or our inner alcoholic will behave sometimes is we think we know a lot and we don't open up and become willing to get feedback from somebody else. So who would that somebody else be? I mean, common sense stuff, guys. Uh, if you're in the rooms of recovery, it's a sponsor. Uh, it's a mentor. Uh, maybe it's a therapist. Maybe you go for professional help, therapy. I, I talk a lot about being a fan of therapy and sponsoring. I'm a fan of both. But here's the trick with this. Uh, when you're asking for feedback from someone who's not personally attached to your circumstance, they're, they're not personally involved with your relationships, they're, they're able to give you an unbiased, for the most part, an unbiased feedback. I mean, we're all human. Sometimes I might be a little biased. You have to have enough humility to be able to receive the feedback to potentially apply it to your life. You know, humility and sobriety is, is in there. I, I don't think I listed it because it's kind of, I probably could have put it within those foundation things. Uh, but, you know, I can ask for feedback all day long, but if I'm not willing to listen to the message, why am I asking? If somebody gives me their feedback, but I've got my walls up and my defenses up so much that I cannot receive it. Well, one, why am I asking, right? But two, why are my walls up so, like so much? You know, why is that? If, if have I, do I like being miserable? 
do I want to stay miserable? Am I that willful? Am I just afraid of being wrong? Is it embarrassing for me to not be right? Is my ego clouding over my decision making to the point that I cannot even receive something from somebody without arguing it or without countering why that shouldn't be? Am I actually being that insecure that I am unable to listen to somebody's opinion and consider it for myself? Or am I, in, so therefore I need to counter it all the time? Like this is a real big one because none of us would get clean and sober if at some point we were not willing to listen to suggestions from other people who have likely gone before us. So sometimes we have to become clear on who are we willing to receive feedback from? Because I don't know about you, but some of us alcoholics, we are stubborn. We are stubborn about who we're gonna receive feedback from. So those are the first three. When I come back from break, I am going to go through number four, four, five, and six. And so if that is, um, so if you wanna know what four, five, and six are, come back. We will be back shortly after break, thanks. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Know You're Crazy show. My name is Susan Denae and you are listening to Emotional Recovery in the Raw. Today I'm talking about top practices in sobriety. I started out the show discussing like foundation principles that we might need to live by in sobriety so that we stay not only sober, sane, maybe even happy most of the time. Uh, those, foundation, those foundational principles were uh, learn, relearning integrity with ourselves, doing what we say we're going to do, being accountable to our behaviors that are obnoxious. I'm just going to say it like that. Uh, the other one is going into tangible action versus trying to think our problems away. Think, 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 think can be also very detrimental. Until I will add this one little tip, until we learn how to think healthy. Okay, I'll, I might reroute to that one. Uh, and then the last one was becoming emotionally aware, uh, becoming aware of our negative emotional uh, crazy when we're in it. So that was, those were the foundational ones. And then I'm going through the practices. And the first three practices that I discussed was admitting something isn't working, surrendering, being willing to accept a new perception, uh, something, you know, there's a new way of looking at this. And then number three was asking for feedback from someone not personally attached to your life. Um, and be, but the, the, the kicker with being willing to receive feedback is being open to receiving it, not the idea of, hey, let me talk to you about this. And then when you give me feedback, I, I counter and argue with that. So I kind of went into that a little bit more than I actually planned. Uh, but asking for feedback, not personally attached to you so that you can get a new perception. So you can get a new perception. And then I just went through a few of the different people that you could do that with, whether you hire a therapist, uh, whether you, you know, it's a mentor, maybe in the rooms of recovery, it's a sponsor, um, a sobriety coach, a life coach will do that with you. Uh, just a few options for you. All right. So what are number, what are the four, five, and six practices in sobriety that helped me stay sane? For the most part, over 22 years, there are some insane moments. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but what were a couple of more practices? Number four was trusting there is a better way. Trusting there is a better way. For you spiritual gurus out there, we could also call this faith. Am I practicing faith or is it just giving it lip service? Do I really, truly trust that there are good things coming do I truly trust that this too shall pass? Do I truly trust that I'm not always going to feel this way? Trusting that there is a better way is an absolute practice in sobriety. I remember uh, in 2021, one of the hardest years I had in sobriety. I remember when I turned 20 years clean, I was like, oh my God, I earned that last year because I had been through uh, some brutal stuff the year before and I hadn't ever been there in sobriety before. And one of the things that kept me willing to keep going was trusting that this will pass. Trusting that if I just took a little bit of tangible action, that this boat will turn. Didn't mean it was going to turn quickly. 
Didn't mean that I was gonna like the work required behind it, but if I trusted that this would pass, I would feel better. And lo and behold, it did pass. I still got some ripple effects from that whole experience. I'm not gonna lie. Not every day is rosy. I was just, just talking with Jonathan there on break about you know how do we uh, stay motivated when we don't wanna be motivated. That is still a challenge for me. I still, I still, that monster still haunts me at times. You know, I'm, I'm not the uh, same level of energy that I had several years ago. It, it's changed. It, it's more of an inspired action today versus a forced motivation. And so there's been a complete upheaval of beliefs. Uh, but do I trust there's a better way in the middle of all of that? And if I do trust, then I'm going to be faithful that something good's coming my way. All right. Something good's coming my way. Number five not giving up no matter how bad the depression is. No, not using or picking up alcohol or drugs, whatever your thing of choice is, but not giving up no matter what. Kind of along the lines of the trusting, but this one is making a firm decision. I'm not giving up no matter what. I don't care how challenging it is with my teenager right now. I am not giving up no matter what. I don't care how challenging my health problems may be. I am not giving up no matter what. I don't care how much I dread going to that gym. I am not giving up no matter what. I don't care how dreadful that job, that job feels. I am not going to give up professionally. I am going to keep putting one foot in front of the other. You hear it? Where is my resolution? I don't care how sad I feel. I know there's a solution out there. I am not going to give up trying. As soon as we give up and we surrender to the misery and we surrender to the pain, that, and in a bad way, surrender, may I say. I'm using that in the opposite context. But as soon as we give up and we stop trying, like, like, like we just we, we, we give up that hope, that's when we're in trouble. If we have a little bit of resolve, if we just know that within us that we, we can get through this, we can get through this, then that is definitely something in sobriety as a practice uh, that I have had to utilize, uh, I think more in the last five years than my entire 22 years of sobriety. Like, I don't know why, if it's, if it's a matter of getting older or it's different you know, beliefs that are being uprooted, but I've had to really dig into that one don't give up no matter what. Don't give up if you don't got a thousand million followers. Don't give up yet. Don't give up if nobody's watching them YouTube videos. Don't give up yet. Like you just keep going. Don't stop going to those summits even when you don't want to go. Don't give up. You just keep going. Keep one foot in that pond, damn it. You just keep going. That's what I'm talking about. Number six. Oh my good. Number six. So for those of you who may not be in the rooms of recovery and sobriety, or maybe you 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 might be familiar with this. I don't know. You know, this is actually something I should probably talk about more. Um, you got to watch for the obsession of the mind. Oh, my God. The obsession of the mind. And I'm going to go ahead and throw in a little bit of law of attraction. Uh, how we can become obsessive over something. I was talking with uh, someone recently who had a situation under their roof. And I simply said to them, what I am hearing is obsession. I'm obsessed with what they're doing and when they're doing it. I know when they're in their bedroom. I know when they're not in their bedroom. I know when they're going out the door. I know when they're not going out the door. I know when they looked for a job and I know when they didn't look for a job. And I know when this person talked to them and I know when and I thought, oh my goodness, damn, you got some obsession going on. You are so obsessed about everything that's going on around you that you're not able to take accountability for your part in that. We got to watch our obsessiveness and how we can fixate on something. You ever had like a problem that you've just mentally masturbated over and over and over and it's just not going away or you've overly obsessed on somebody else's behavior? Usually that'll happen with somebody that we live with. It's miserable. And I just have to say us addicts and alcoholics, we are some of the worst when it comes to obsession. Our, our character within us sometimes, I don't know if like, you, you get shopping too much. You get obsessed about different things you collect. Uh, I was recently cleaning out a couple of bedrooms in my house, moving one person to another room. And, and if you ever cleaned up somebody's room or their space, you really learn a lot about them. You learn about what they obsess about. You, you learn about what they collect, like where their thoughts are most of the time. But for an addict or an alcoholic, when we obsess to the point of misery, 
Are we obsessed to the point of overly controlling? Are we obsessed to the point of thinking we know right? And there's nothing, we're not leaving any space for new ideas, for peace of mind. We don't leave any of that available because we are so stuck in our obsession. That's a problem. So watching for the obsession of the mind and how it shows up for you is one of the main practices in sobriety. Um, yeah. All right. That was number four, five, and six. Now I am going to go for number seven, eight, nine, and 10. All right. Number seven, seven, number seven practice, cleaning up our damage, cleaning up our wreckage. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're new in sobriety and you have yet to reflect back on the damage that you may have done in your addiction to the people around you, to those that were affected by your addiction and by your behaviors. Um, if you're somebody who doesn't work with a mentor or someone who doesn't work with a sobriety coach or a life coach or you know anybody like that, uh, I would suggest you do that before you go back and try to clean up some stuff. Sometimes we're just good at cleaning it up and, and we're able to find our part and make apologies to those that we've damaged. This is what I'm talking about. Cleaning up our damage, uh, making reparations for what we did goes back to that foundational Relearning integrity, doing what we say we're going to do. How many times when we were using, and this can happen in sobriety also, because, you know, these practices that I'm going over, this is continuous. This isn't an overnight thing. This isn't something where you just wake up one day and say, oh, okay, I'm going to do this today. And next week I'm going to do this. And then the following day. No, this is an ongoing living practice. That, that's why I'm going over these with you. This is over. This is. This is never ending. This is the part in the beginning when I said this may become tiring. It may wear you out. You may get tired of this in sobriety. But if I want to stay sober and I want to stay with integrity of myself, I have to be able to take the accountability, once again, part of the foundational framework, and really look at where did I do damage. And I have to be willing to clean up my damage. And this can happen, like I said, in our cups when we're using or even in sobriety, when our selfishness acts up, our self-centeredness acts up, and we just make people around us miserable. We make people around us miserable. We have to be willing to go back and clean up that damage because that is how our relationships get reestablished. Um, I had the honor of, of working with somebody right now who is absolutely all over this piece of it. And she is understanding 100% of what her role was for the first time. And the transformation that's occurring is amazing to watch this happen. All right, so when I come back from break, I am going to wrap up number eight, nine, and 10 of the top practices. Remember, these are the three best ones coming up because I saved the best for the last. Uh, so if you are hanging in there with me today and you are interested in what number eight, nine, and 10 are, then please stay tuned because that is what I will be wrapping up the show with today. Be back shortly. Hi, folks. Welcome back to the Know Your Crazy Show. My name is Susan Denae, and you are listening to Emotional Recovery in the Raw. Today is Top Practices in Sobriety. I'm going to just do a little reminder here. A number of the foundational, rediscovering integrity, accountability. This one's for you, Jonathan. Action, not thinking. Action, not thinking. Because sometimes we can think ourselves into paralyzation and procrastination. And so really it's about, okay, I just need to get into action about this and then see where it goes. And then the last one is the negative emotional awareness, being aware of our negative emotions and how they can dictate um, our daily life and being able to spot check that. All right. So now going into the last stretch here, I am going to go over sobriety practices, eight, nine, and 10. Uh, these are the ones that when I really thought about it, all practice, all these practices I've given are part of my life, but these last three, I think, are really the, um, the needle mover. 
Is that right? Is that the right saying? The needle mover moves the needle. Yeah, I think that's right. All right, number eight. Understand there is something working. There, understand there is something working greater than ourselves. For some people, they may call that a higher power. For other people, they may call it God. For some, it may be universal awareness. Sometimes people call it nature. But just understanding that there's more to the equation than just you. There's more components working things out than just you. Whether you think that's energetic connection, whatever that is, there is something greater at work. For example, and this stuff, these conversations happen all the time. I'm trying to remember the one I had just today. I think she she was doing something and she said, so I so I changed my mind, I showed up, and this other person was there and had exactly what I needed. And she's like, What are the odds of that? And we got to have this conversation about, well, there's bigger things at play than just you. All these components have to work together simultaneously for us to live this life of, if you want to say manifestation or actionable results, but a lot of things have to come into play in order for this cooperation to work. So just understanding that there is something greater working here than just me. It's not all about me. It's not all about you. We like to think it's all about us, but it's not. Sometimes it's about what our impact is on others. And one of the things about doing what I do for a living when I don't feel like wanting to even show up and do a podcast is, Susan, it may not be all about you today. It may be about somebody who's tuning in who can't really benefit from whatever you're going to say, which to me, because this is what I do and this is what I live, is no, it's really no big deal. I mean, I'm talking to people every day. I talked to three different women today you know, in it, working it, talking it, you know, coaching it, mentoring it, whatever. So this is like second nature to me, but there might be somebody listening today that needed me to log on and do this show. So it may not be all about me. So what is the bigger picture and keeping that in mind that sometimes I have to have a bigger perception than just me, 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 right? Something greater is working here and I have to trust that process. All right, number nine. This is a good one. I was kind of stalling a little bit, trying to formulate, well, how would I explain this? And then I read a blog and it was like spot on. Practice what you preach. It's in alignment with that very first foundational principle of relearning integrity. Practice what you preach. I will be honest with you. I am not the uh, recovery person you want to work with if you want to tell me you ain't got time to do certain things. I'm not the one. I'm not the one because I have done so much in recovery and in my personal life practices, in addition to raising many, <laughs> many children, uh, going through a divorce, being remarried, working full time, building a new career, learning new skill sets. Like I have done all that. So I know what is possible. But because I know what is possible, I also know how challenging it can be. And I also know that that's not for everybody. And then it stopped being for me too. But I do practice what I preach. I will never coach somebody on something that I have not experienced. One of the best benefits I had of my father passing away of COVID suddenly was I now learned what grief was. I did not ever talk about grief really before he died. I had like one woman I worked with that really struggled in grief. And I remember my feedback to her was limited because I personally hadn't been there and done the work to, to see what that was like. And when he died, I started to understand grief. I could have not ever talked about hormones and menopause and perimenopause until I personally walked through it. I will never preach something that I have not practiced. I guarantee you that. You will always know where I stand and what I stand on and how I stand there because I'm not good at being fake. I, I just, I'm not, I'm not. And so if, and fake is out of integrity. You know, how often do we fight to be who we truly want to be? And we put up a front for other individuals. So in sobriety, one of my best practices, practice what I preach, practice what I preach. And so if I am somebody who is coaching you as a sober person, right? I, it's not that I have high expectations of you, but I just, I understand that what is possible in sobriety and what is doable. And 
if you are not somebody who can practice what you preach, I likely won't work with you. I just, I won't. And it's not because I don't have compassion or empathy for you, but it's because that is a piece of, ooh, I want to say solidarity, integrity, in sobriety that I think is super important. Super important. Practice what you preach. I mean, hell, if you're going to lie, at least admit you're a liar. That's what I'm talking about. Like live within your own actions. All right. And then the last but not least, and then let me see how much time I got here. I think I got I think I'm down to like, I don't know, four minutes or something. Number 10, this is the, this is like the deal. Uh, give it away. Give it away. What do I mean? I got to get out of self. I got to give the gifts that have been given to me away. In the rooms of recovery, uh, we have, for those of us willing to do it, we sponsor. Uh, we sit down with individuals and we work them through a framework free of charge. We take their phone calls when they're suffering. We don't ever hesitate. We show up at the treatment centers when they need rides. We don't hesitate. Uh, we show up in jails and institutions when they need us. We don't hesitate. We give freely of what has been given to us because we know that's one of the key foundations in staying sober. That's not for everybody. That's not a sober lifestyle for everybody. But what are you giving away free of charge today? Not being paid for it. Not being paid for it because, and, and I stress that because some individuals are paid for mental health therapy. That's different than giving it away. Some people are paid for working in treatment centers of alcoholism and addiction, but that's not giving it away. There's a difference between authentically giving away something that has been given to you to help another person in a compassionate way to lift them up and to carry them that will separate the BS from the real. Learning to give away what has been given so freely to you, whether that means you're going to be a mentor, whether that means you're going to be a volunteer, but you are going to help somebody without a paycheck, without a motive, other than it's a right thing to do, to give back to another fellow human being. Giving it away changed my life. It taught me how to be a mother. It taught me how to detach with love. It taught me so much about me. And it's a game changer. It's a game changer. So one of my top sobriety practices was giving this thing away. I'm 22 years clean and sober. I uh, helped people a few times before I became seven years clean. But then I became seven years clean and something changed in my life. Actually, I got real miserable. And I had to go back and I had to upgrade my life. And I did it in a very uh, intentional, focused way. And that's when all everything changed. And I began to help others unconditionally. And I, and I did it while raising four children. I did it while working for full time. It can be done. Um, and it changed my life because, you know, when we get out of self and we give this gift back to others and we're able to see lives transformed, there is no way to explain the feeling that that gives you other than if you walk through it and you do it. When you see a life transform in front of you, when you see lightness come in, when you see a new perception downloaded to which they have a brand new experience with their life, that, my friends, is what living is all about. That makes all the job stuff seem, seem irrelevant. That makes all the, the ludicrous bullshit that we'll argue about and call it, it makes it all irrelevant. You just give away what's been given to you freely and watch the miracles in front of your eyes. And that will convince you that there's a greater source working in life. That will convince you. So I hope if you join me today for the entire show that some of that helped you as far as best practices and sobriety. For any of you celebrating a sobriety today, congratulations to you. My 10 practices may not be your 10 practices, but maybe there's something in there that helps or that you can add to your toolbox um, and more to you and happy sobriety. And that is a wrap. Bye guys. See you next week. You have been listening to Know You're Crazy. 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 And my name is Susan Denae. We are identifying, understanding, and treating your crazy one episode at a time. Tune in to TransformationTalkRadio.com. To connect with me or Growth Spurt Your Life, please visit SusanDenae.com. That's Susan Denae, D-E-N-E-E.com.